It's uh, December 4th, and it's the height of the second or the third wave, however you want to count it. And uh, we are really appreciative of our great colleagues and friends at Cedar sinai in L.A. to uh, bat today, and they have an amazing team there. I think Dr. Terrence Kim is going to take the lead and introduce his um, uh, outstanding colleagues. And the topic today will be robotics and spine surgery, and we'll have a, a solid journal club on reviewing the emerging evidence base. Uh, as I'm looking at the screen, this is a, a fabulous group of colleagues here. So take it from here, Dr. Kim. Thanks, Jens. Um, welcome, everyone, from the West Coast. Um, it's about uh, 6 o'clock this morning, um, but uh, we have an exciting lineup today. I <clears throat> want to thank you, Jens and uh, Ashley and Linda and all the SSF uh, people for their continued commitment on education and keeping these things going. This has um, been great for our fellows or, and residents during the time of, of COVID and restrictions. So um, kudos and keep going. Um, our uh, topic today at Cedars is uh, near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, it's robotic spine surgery. Um, and the reason um, all of us picked this topic was uh, there had to be a little bit more critical analysis on the uh, data and the research that's being done because um, I don't think we have a good handle on um, the quality. Um, we have a great lineup today. Our general moderators are uh, Pat Johnson, uh, Hyun Bae, and Neil Anand. Um, and then we have um, a bunch of uh, uh, up and coming rising stars in the world of spine. Uh, and they'll be presenting our articles. I'll introduce each one individually and then uh, the associated faculty. So let's get started. Um, we have uh, more or less four articles uh, to present. Uh, the first one um, is uh, will be presented by our uh, chief neurosurgery resident, J. Manuel Sarmiento. It is on min minimally invasive robotic versus open fluoroscopic guided spinal instrumented fusions. Um, J. Manuel, um, Manuel is going to uh, HSS for his fellowship next year. Um, and the faculty is, who's the faculty? Oh, it's me. I believe it's, yeah, it's Chris Kong. Okay, get started. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Kim, uh, for that introduction. Um, uh, my name is Manuel Sarmiento. Uh, the paper I'm presenting is Minimally Invasive Robotic, which is Open Fluoroscopic Guided Spinal Instrumented Fusions, Randomized Controlled Trial um, out of uh, Seoul National University in South Korea. Uh, so open uh, transpedicular screw fixation has historically required extensive tissue dissection, um, and uh, that's, been, uh, um, that's been mitigated by MIS techniques um, and screw placement However, uh, there is a learning curve associated with MIS techniques, as well as extensive uh, fluoroscopy historically. Uh, so enter uh, robotic spinal surgery, where we have another avenue of, uh, of having a tissue sparing approach um, with, uh, with MIS approaches, but also the potential for minimization of fluoroscopy. And so you have uh, here on the on this left side, um, uh, you have the fluoroscopic guided open pedicle screw uh, fixation, um, and this is a technique most familiar to spine surgeons. However, it is associated with uh, increased tissue trauma, increased postoperative pain, and prolonged convalescence. On the right side, we have robotic guided MIS screw placement. This is uh, the Mazor Renaissance robot, which was used in this study I'm presenting. Um, here we have a muscle sparing uh, MIS approach to reduce the length of stay and post-operative pain. However, robotics is associated uh, itself with a, another steep learning curve. Um, and MIS has historically been associated with limited fields of views and um, other techniques have been associated with increased radiation exposure and hazard. Um, for, uh, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble here. So the date of publication of the study is March 2017. Um, it's a single center prospective randomized clinical trial with level 1B evidence. And the objective was to compare the impact of uh, robotic guidance, MIS, to a fluoroscopy guided uh, approach 
or lumbar fusion. Uh, sorry, Ashley, it gets, uh, it keeps circling two whenever I go up and down. Let's see here. So the inclusion criteria were patients undergoing one or two level lumbar fusions for degenerative lumbar disorders between December 2013 to, to January 2015. Exclusion criteria included patients suffering from primary bone, muscular, or neurologic diseases, infection, or malignancies. Um, a posterior approach was performed by, uh, for all the surgeries by a single surgeon. Uh, the clinical outcomes that were assessed include uh, pedicle screw placement accuracy, um, and, and that that's, was um, uh, uh, a modified Gertzman Robbins classification was ascribed to each pedicle screw that was placed, and that's according. And that was given um, uh, a grade. Grade one is uh, is screwed completely within the pedicle, all the way down to grade E, where the pedicle cortical breach is greater than or equal to six millimeters. Clinical outcomes that were assessed also include the visual analog uh, scale for back and leg pain, as well as the ODI for pre and post operative disabilities. Radiation exposure um, was uh, measured by C-arm output and MSVs, and seconds of fluoroscopy by uh, thermal, thermal luminescent dosimeters. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the results, uh, table one, show the patient characteristics between the, um, uh, the robotic group and the open fluoroscopic group. Um, we have 60 total patients, 30 patients were randomly assigned to either treatment cohort, and the mean follow-up was 16.3 months. Uh, there was no significant demographic uh, 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 differences noted um, between each group with the, uh, with the exception uh, of one, and that was uh, the preoperative ODI. Um, preoperative ODI uh, was uh, significantly lower um, in the robotic group, uh, group uh, compared to the open fluoroscopic group at 24.5 compared to 28.9. Um, here we have table two. Uh, table two shows the peri and postoperative results between the open and the robotic group. Um, and uh, something just uh, uh, to note is they, they noted operative time skin to skin and the operative time was comparable and similar in both the robotic and the open fluoroscopic arm as well. Um, the fluoroscopy per screw uh, uh, was noted. And uh, if you look at uh, seconds uh, per screw, um, it was 3.5 in the robotic arm uh, compared to 13.3 uh, in the fluoroscopic arm. Um, as well as if you, if you take a look at uh, MSVs per screw, the, uh, it's 0 0.1 in the robotic arm, and that was 0 0.3 um, in the fluoroscopic open arm. Again, both uh, came out to be statistically significant. And just for comparison, just so you have a point of reference, uh, about 0 0.1 MS MSV is, is about an equivalent uh, radiation to one chest X-ray, to put it into perspective. Um, if we take a look at uh, pedicle screw ac accuracy, uh, we see that um, the accuracy was very similar um, between uh, uh, both groups. Um, we have uh, uh, the majority of screws were grade A screws, about 127 grade A screws in the, in the robotic group and about 137 in the open fluoroscopic arm. A single revision, however, was required in each cohort with the fluoro uh, open fluoroscopic group. Um, a new neurologic deficit was caused by medial uh, violation of the pedicle. And that was the cause for that, re uh, for, for that revision in the open group. And the robotic group, the revision was uh, due to um, cage dis uh, dislodgement. Uh, as far as the postoperative clinical outcomes, um, VAS and, and uh, ODIs were similar uh, between both cohorts. And uh, however, length of stay was significantly longer in the fluoroscopy uh, cohort. And that was 9.4 uh, days compared to um, a mean of 6.8 days if you look at the, uh, uh, the robotic arm. 
there was a, uh, a learning curve analysis that was performed for the robotic guidance group. Um, the authors took 30 patients um, in this cohort and they were charted chronologically. The first 15 patients were compared to the second group according to time of instrumentation per screw in minutes and seconds of fluoroscopy per screw. And as you see here in the charts, um, uh, the more cases the author performed, uh, the, uh, the, the decrease or shorter the minutes per screw placement uh, turned out to be over time. Uh, so limitations. Um, before we get to the limitations, I want to talk about the pros uh, of the paper. Um, uh, and that is that the study uh, was, uh, this is a randomized study. And so we, we know how difficult it is, it can be to organize a randomized study uh, in surgery and, and have uh, patients actually uh, agree to be randomized to a surgical procedure. So I think that's worth highlighting. Um, number two is they included interesting secondary uh, outcome variables. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, they, they added reoperations, they added operative time, uh, they added uh, a learning curve analysis. Um, but uh, in terms of some limit, some limitations here, oh gosh, it's not working. Sorry, Ash. Clearly, you're having problems with it. So just uh, wrap it up. Yeah, this is uh, so. Um, uh, this, how many patients received CT radiation just for robotic guidance planning? Um, that wasn't mentioned in the paper. And should this be factored into radiation exposure for patients? Should one or more extra study comparison arms have been added? Um, I can't help but think that uh, it would be interesting just to add, to have a navigation-based MIS arm um, to compare it to the robotic guidance arm. Number three, a, a study with larger sample size in each uh, study arm would improve the power and help delineate two di uh, true differences between robotic guidance and uh, open surgery. But that being said, the take home points are that robotic guidance is an enabling technology for MIS and may help overcome two barriers for adoption of MIS technologies. And that is uh, two, uh, high occupational hazards of intraoperative ionizing radiation and pedicles group uh, uh, placement and, and, uh, and accuracy issues. Uh, number two is a potential reduction in hospital length of stay for one or two level lumbar spinal fusions. And number three is uh, the adoption of robotic uh, guidance MIS appears to be a safe alternative to open fluoroscopic uh, placement of transpedicular screw fixation. So right. thank you for your attention. Okay. Thanks, Manuel. Um, in, I like to say in the name of keeping things brief, we should keep things moving along, but I think we should at least review uh, a little bit about that paper. It was well designed, it seems, and it seems to answer a question rather efficiently. Um, but I think you you uh, brought up something important with the uh, omission or the missing uh, study group of the navigated screws or navigated MIS screws. So, um, is there is there anything you think that says about even the paper itself to not have a comparison group that is uh, that consists of patients getting screws with just CT, ORM, stealth. Um, uh, yeah, because it seems like, I think when most people read this paper, they would consider that as a reasonable group for comparison in a study like this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think it's, I think, I think that it's, uh, I think it's a good foundational paper to compare an open robotic approach to uh, a, a robotic uh, MIS approach to an open, uh, open fluoroscopic group um, because I think it, it, it heightens and strengthens um, the look of the robot and, and the, the effectiveness of the robot. Uh, however, I, it, it's, it's important not to conflate robotic guided success with the advantages of, of an MIS approach, right? And so if you, if you really want to delineate real advantages of, of robotic guidance MIS, why don't we test it against, um, uh, against percutaneous screws and, and other MIS approaches that, or navigated MIS? And I think that would be um, another way to, to highlight its advantages against just a, a purely traditional open uh, fluoroscopic uh, screw placement. Thanks. I, I, just, wanted to, <clears throat> I just wanted to bring up, 
I just wanted to bring up, it was pretty interesting in this paper, and I think this is just um, a practice difference in Korea. There were 10, there are probably 10 transfusions in the robotic group, 14 transfusions in the fluoroscopic group. So a robotic MIS group received 10 transfusions. Um, and the average hospital stay for both groups is around seven to eight days. So it, it tells us a little bit about, you know, the, the practice difference between Korea and the U.S. Because I don't think any of us, I mean, this is probably more of an outpatient procedure, a one-day hospital stay. And I'm not sure a one to two level fusion that we've, you know, transfusions are very, very rare. I couldn't agree with you more. We have to keep going, but I picked this article because it's one of the top uh, articles that's um, referenced uh, as a randomized controlled trial um, for a lot of meta-analysis and other uh, discussions. So just kind of point out that um, the quality of it is not um, ideal. Okay, our next uh, paper uh, will be presented by Chris Johnson. He's our um, PGY uh, almost to be chief resident for orthopedics. Um, he is uh, going on fellowship interviewing. So all of the uh, faculty uh, and fellowship directors out there that are looking, um, here's a little um, exposure. Um, he'll be presenting the initial intraoperative experience with robotic assisted pedicle screw placement with stealth navigation and pediatric spine deformity, an evaluation of the first 40 cases. Um, this will be uh, moderated also by uh, Lindsay Ross, our neurosurgery faculty. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Johnson, PGY4 at uh, Orthopedic Surgery Resident at Cedar sinai so I'll be, I'll be presenting the article, Initial Interoperative Experience with Robotic Assisted Pedicle Screw Placement with Stealth Navigation in Pediatric Spine Deformity and Evaluation of the First 40 Cases. The article was published in the Journal of Robotic Surgery in October 2020 by Dr. Derek Gonzalez and the senior author, Dr. Daniel Hedquist, out of Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, the study was a case series, a retrospective cohort review, making it level four evidence. The purpose of the study was to present the first 40 pediatric deformity correction cases using the robotic assisted navigation platform. So as you know, safe and efficient pedicle screw placement is critical in spine surgery, especially in deformity correction cases. Uh, robotic assisted screw placement is intended to improve the surgical technique and in multiple studies has been shown to improve the accuracy as compared to fluoroscopic freehand placement. Prior to publication of this article, there were no published reports of robotic assisted navigation in pediatric deformity. Um, this study was a single site, single surgeon case series. The Mazer X Stealth Edition robotic platform was used for all pedicle screw placement. This was used in conjunction with either preoperative or intraoperative CT. Uh, bone mounts were placed at either the posterior superior iliac spine with a chance pin or at a spinous process with a clamp. Uh, screws were placed with a cannulated drill guide followed by uh, navigated drilling, then navigated tapping, and finally navigated power placement of the screws. All screws were then checked with intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy and postoperative radiographs. Uh, so here are some of the results. Table one on the left is a summary of patient demographics. Uh, 40 patients were included in all with an average age of 14 and a half years, 33 females and seven males. Uh, there were 26 AIS patients, five neuromuscular, four spondylolisthesis, two congenital scoliosis, one congenital kyphosis, one tumor, and one non-union case. Uh, table two on the right is a summary of surgical data. 12 patients uh, had preoperative CT scans, 29 had intraoperative CT with O-arm. Uh, one patient with a preoperative CT had to be converted to using the O-arm due to a registration difficulty. Uh, in all 314 total pedicle screws were placed, 310 of which were confirmed to be accurate with intraoperative fluoroscopy and postoperative radiographs, uh, leading to a calculated accuracy of 98.7%. Um, there was an average of eight and a half screws placed per patient and the mean robot time, which was measured as the time for mounting the robotic arm to final screw placement was 55 minutes. Uh, four technical difficulties with screw placement were encountered. Three screws were malpositioned laterally and had to be replaced manually. One screw had to be abandoned due to a sclerotic pedicle. Uh, there were also four cases of system problems. One difficulty with registration, uh, one failed fluoroscopic registration that had to be um, transitioned to an O-arm intraoperative CT. 
one topographical scanning difficulty and one navigation array difficulty. All of these uh, issues were resolved with intraoperative troubleshooting and no patients experienced any new postoperative neurologic deficits or radicular symptoms. Uh, there were some limit limitations to the study. It's a pretty straightforward study as it, as it is a case series. It's a report of their first 40 cases. Um, the, the major limitation, I think, is that routine postoperative CT scanning was not used, which makes judging the true accuracy of pedicles replacement uh, difficult. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's a case series with no comparison cohorts, so the level of evidence is limited. Uh, the major take-home point of this study is uh, that it's a single center, single surgeon study that shows that the Maser x Dell system demonstrates successful and safe pedicle screw placement in pediatric deformity cases. And that's my final slide. It's pretty, pretty fairly straightforward study, so if, if we want to have some questions or discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Great job on your presentation. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head here. Um, when you're talking about this pediatric population, um, they were really unable to get those post-operative CTs to truly see the accuracy of the pedicle screw placement. And they even talked in the article about um, previous systemic uh, uh, systematic reviews where they saw that um, for scoliosis, um, the accuracy of pedicle screw placement with um, fluoroscopy was 4% and then that jumped to 15% when they used the CT to evaluate it, to evaluate the pedicle screw placement. So I think the question here really is kind of what are the implications for a pediatric population for using this technology with extending operative time and increased uh, radiation exposure and is it really ready for prime time in pediatrics? And I think one other big issue in this um, article that they, that they brought up uh, was, um, you know, the, the robot is really good for using the uh, robotic arm for trajectory, um, for the preoperative planning, and then for the real-time uh, navigation. Um, but using intraoperative CT, most of the patients that they use, 29 out of 40, use the scan and plan. And um, about nine or so use the preoperative CT, use that pre-op planning portion of the robot, which we, we think of as so important. Um, for, for their cases. So most of these pediatric patients were getting the intraoperative CT. So I kind of, for the panel, kind of, you know, what are, your, what are the implications for using this in the pediatric population? Is it really ready for prime time? I can just jump in with a couple comments. Susie Lieberman from Texas back. Uh, as most of you know, I've been uh, involved with the Missouri development uh, from its inception. The one thing that you've got to remember for the intraoperative validation or verification, you do not have to do another CT scan. You can re-register with another AP and oblique x-ray, and then you overlay your registration on your pre-op plan, and you can see exactly where your screws are. So it really is just two more shots, uh, fluoroscopic shots in the operating room as opposed to a full CT scan after surgery or another intraoperative spin. So you don't need to be doing that. Yeah, and in this case, they, they talked a little bit about that, but he said that it was difficult with the rotation of the scoli scoliotic patients to really get those fluoro shots. So they kind of decided that it was easier to work up a scan and plan me registration method. Yeah, so again, that's, that's gonna be an experience issue and lining up your x-rays appropriately so you key off one vertebral body. Uh, and that just takes time to, to figure out how to do that with some of these curves. Granted, curves that are above 70 to 80 degrees are very difficult to register. But the vast majority are in the 40 to 60 degree range, and it really is not an issue uh, registering. And you asked what the value is in the pediatric world. Uh, the value here is the preoperative planning. Uh, you can get in there ahead of time and you know exactly what you're going to need in terms of implants, instruments, and what the expected correction is going to be with these kids. So that's where, where I really see the bonus. I completely uh, agree. And I think that if this, if they did this 40 series and they did that preoperative planning for most of them, then I would really like to see the outcomes from that because I, I agree. I think that's what's great about the robot is that you're able to do that preoperative planning and reduce the intraoperative scan time and, and everything goes along with that. So, Right. 
So Izzy, it's Pat Johnson, and uh, thank you for chiming in, and uh, your expertise is uh, maybe unparalleled. So this study has some limitations. I won't go into that, but I want to ask you, I mean, given all of your knowledge that you have, when you're talking about doing your registration, would you rather have an intraoperative CT scan or a preoperative overlay or, or merging? And if you just, if you could just snap your fingers and say, which one do I have right now for your non 90 degree curve case, which one would you do? Well, it all depends on how many levels and the extent of the surgery. Uh, if I'm doing a one level spondy or one level degenerative, an intraoperative scan and plan is the most efficient. That's and probably the least dose of radiation compared to the pre-op workup that you're going to be giving them. But if you're doing three or four levels and then you've got a patient under an anesthetic for an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes while you're doing this scan and plan, I don't think that's efficient. So that's where I'd rather have the pre-op information. What is coming out now that's going to be very, very exciting is the planning off of MRI scan and the bone CT or the MRI CT bone merge images that we're getting. The accuracy of those things are much better and you're going to be able to do your planning on an MRI scan. So eliminate radiation, which is clearly our goal uh, with everything. So let, let me just ask that question to the next step with the big deformity cases, you're doing 10 levels. You want an intraoperative CT scan for that kind of case? No, I, I don't. I get a pre-op scan for that. Uh, when you're doing that many levels, uh, what I've seen and experienced firsthand is you need multiple spins. You can't do it all in, in one spin. And I think you're, uh, far, you're radiating your patients far more with those multiple spins, uh, plus the OR time. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of people out there saying, oh, the spin only takes two to three minutes. Uh, but that's not been my experience. By the time it comes into the room, by the time you set up, you get one scan, you do it. it it's a 10, 15, sometimes 20 minute experience. And that's with a good x-ray tech. Uh, Izzy, Izzy, it's Neil. Um, honestly, thank you for that. But I couldn't agree more with you. We've done it on pre-ops now. We've done about 10 cases now. I must say I'm extremely surprised. It works really well on the pre-op scan. It works even after we've done our laterals. As you know, we stage it, we'll do all our laterals. And still the pre-op scan prior to the lateral with segmentation works extremely well for the screws. That to me was the biggest surprise that we could go body to body segmented. That we've done about four now. So yeah, kudos to you, Izzy. I think we've come a long way from where we started and have been very impressed with this. Thank you. And, and, I, and I agree with you, this intra-op scanning, there really is no necessity and we need to stop this. It's not good for our patients. Thanks. You know, I'll push back on the um, the fluoro matching um, only because uh, I'm working through that process as well. Uh, two cases in particular, uh, highly rotated apex thoracic curve, uh, couldn't get it to match. That was very frustrating. That took about 30 minutes to uh, so on. And then the other, uh, you know, couple minutes to get the O-arm to come in. Uh, the second one was a, um, a patient who had ACDFs in the front and the cervical and then had some previous thoracic instrumentation in the uh, mid thoracic. The hardware, the actual hardware itself, for okay. some reason, messed up the sof software so that it could not match it at that um, proximal thoracic region. So um, it's not just apex. There, it's, it's not perfect. It's, yeah, it's I, a little I, finicky, but for lumbar, Maybe, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree, Dr. Kim. And I think that's the reason why this author, most of the cases were in scan and plan. And I think, you know, Izzy mentioning the MRI um, emergency CT is really going to be, I think, the we next iteration, as long as that's user friendly. Like the newcomer comes in, they said this guy had no robotic uh, history Same. before, but it should be easy enough to do and merge and accurate to do so for and be able yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Tesla. be a preoperative plan. What do you say, Neil? Tesla? I think Neil, I think your microphone is on. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. For me, on the pediatric scoliosis side, the biggest <laughs> difference is the plasticity and the flexibility of the spine or absence thereof, and differentiating concave versus convex side pedicles, and uh, then looking at the di pedicle dysplasia. Uh, for me, this is again the great. Point. 
Carry, carry on. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, we'll give uh, Jens um, uh, that moment once he gets his microphone uh, working. Um, but there he comes. Okay, good. So, so uh, dysplasia of pedicles, this is a great promise of robotics, but getting the plasticity so we can actually truly try to realign and make sense of that uh, vertebra, that uh, misshapen vertebra so that we can control it more or less and then translate that insight into the optics and the software recognition. That's a big challenge, that's a big promise. So uh, on the proprioception side, let's just uh, uh, hit Izzy with that. How, where are the robotics nowadays in terms of anti-slip or penetration uh, uh, recognition in these very sclerotic pedicles? I think Chris was mentioning that they had some technical problems with that. And that for me, intraoperatively, is still one of the big challenges of when are we in, when are we out in these misshapen vertebra. So th those are all very challenging situations, and the reality of it is we're, we're picking on the most difficult of the cases when 85% of the robotic appropriate cases are pretty straightforward. So on these difficult cases, it really boils down, particularly when you're using the uh, Mazor technology, uh, stabilizing the spine with the various clamps to make sure that the spine does not snake underneath. Uh, you also have to make sure when you're drilling that you're not putting too much pressure onto the spine because as Jens pointed out, the spine will move. There is some plasticity to it there. Another thing is making sure that your assistant isn't pushing up or leaning against the patient while you're trying to drill. Uh, all of these little things can affect the potential for skive or misplaced screws. With respect to the misshapen vertebral body, this is what I really uh, learned to appreciate about the preoperative planning. I know when I'm gonna put an in, out, in screw, and as I'm drilling, I can feel that in, out, in trajectory, which gives me that sense of confidence. And then as I go to correct the spine, I know I've still got a good hold with a screw that's well seated in the vertebral body, despite it's an in out in and it's not skiving down the side of the vertebral body or crossing through the canal. Uh, so those are the things that you just have to really work with the pre-op planning to appreciate prior to coming into the operating room. So you know exactly what to expect. You've rehearsed that surgery uh, before you even get into the operating room. And over time, we're going to have much more technology. And what I'm really excited about is the uh, virtual augmented reality that's coming. That's going to add another tool to the robotics, to the navigation, to the virtual environment, where we're just going to be able to do better and address all of these uh, points in those very difficult cases. I'm not sure it's going to make that much of a difference for the straightforward cases, but, but these high cervical thoracic, the bad deformities, the revisions, taking all this technology is going to make us better. Always the champion of robots. Thanks, Izzy. Uh, it's just inspiring always to hear you talk about the next steps. Um, our, we have to keep going. Our next uh, paper, um, we usually don't do meta-analyses for um, journal clubs, but uh, there are so many out there. I tried to pick the newest one. And um, no matter what it is, I want the whole group to just talk about, do they believe what these meta-analyses are telling us or do they not believe? They talk about complications, this, this, and that. I want the group to say, is the, are these meta-analyses right on with everyone's experience or not? Go ahead, George. Good morning, uh, George Hanna here, Neurosurgical Spine Fellow this year, uh, presenting with Dr. Barron here at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about um, the a paper, this meta-analysis that just came out and as we know, a meta-analysis is just as good as the, um, the papers that it's reviewing. So there are some big potential limitations that we'll discuss, but it's a safety and accuracy of robot-assisted placement of pedicle screws compared to conventional freehand technique, um, published out of the Department of Neurosurgery at MGH. Here's the paper, Fatima et al, 2020 published in the Spine Journal. 
So what was the study aim to evaluate the efficacy and safety profile of robotic assisted pedicle screw placement compared to conventional freehand technique? When they talked about the freehand technique, it was with or without um, fluoroscopic assistance. Um, and although there do exist multiple studies and one previous meta-analysis, there have been conflicting previous results. So what they did is they evaluated pooled data using dual evaluation methods, both radiographic and clinical outcome. Then they performed a meta-analysis of all randomized and non-randomized controlled trials that met their inclusion uh, criteria. The primary outcome measurement for efficacy was pedicle screw accuracy. The secondary outcome measures were safety, which included complication rates, proximal facet joint violation, intraoperative radiation time, radiation dosage, and the length of surgery. So in terms of pedicle screw accuracy, they used the Gerstmann Robbins classification system, which is demonstrated here. Um, they specifically, most of these papers talked about grade A screws, which were intraparticular screw, screws without breach of the cortical layer of the pedicle, or grade B screws, screws that breached the cortical layer of the pedicle but did not exceed it laterally by more than two millimeters. Um, so just here are some radiographic examples of that. And then they went further to say that perfect screws were ones that were grade A pedicle screws with zero millimeter deviation and uh, clinically acceptable pedicle screws, which included grades A and B, were less than or equal to three millimeters outside the pedicle. So what they did is they pulled 410 articles from multiple databases um, and they narrowed them down to a total of 19 articles, seven randomized controlled trials and 12 non-randomized controlled trials, which included one cadaveric study, which we'll talk about in the limitation. The freehand technique was included whether or not fluoroscopy was performed. So there was a total of 1,525 full patients, approximately 50% in each group, the control group being the freehand technique. So first outcome measure, so um, accuracy of pedicle screw placement. All studies except two reported perfect pedicle screw insertion. And using the odds ratio demonstrated that robotic assisted pedicle screw placement had a 1.68 time um, fold higher likelihood of achieving perfect accuracy. And then for clinically acceptable pedicle screws, same thing, the robot assisted group had some superior results in this meta-analysis. Complications. Uh, eight studies out of the 19 talked about complications, and um, they included hardware failure, surgical revision, wound infections, neurologic deficits. Overall complications were 69% less likely in patients with, in the robot-assisted group. Proximal facet joint violation, which is associated with increased ac and accelerated incidence of adjacent segment disease. Four studies talked about this, and the robot-assisted group had a 90 92% fewer proximal facet joint violation. And perhaps this is attributable to the greater three-dimensional visualization in the robotic assisted group with the planning. Uh, radiation exposure, again, a major limitation we'll talk about. Um, based on their analyses, they came to the conclusion that the robot assisted pedicle screw placement group had significantly lower radiation time than the freehand group. And um, the robot assisted group received significantly less doses of intraoperative radiation than the, uh, in terms of the patients as well. Surgical time, the, this is one uh, where the freehand group actually was superior. They had uh, a lower surgical time than the um, robotic assisted group. And, you know, could be due to the learning curve and the increased steps that one needs to take. So there were major limitations of the study. So I think it's, it's quite dangerous to make all your conclusions based on this meta-analysis. Because as we know, meta-analysis are just as good as the constituent studies that they evaluate. And some of these studies had major limitations. So these studies included different robotic platforms, including Mazer, Tianji, Rosa, and Tanavi. As we know, there's a new FDA-approved uh, robotic system, Excelsius GPS. Uh, produced by Globus that's currently being used. There's also the CIS-1 system in Australia that wasn't reviewed in these studies. 
uh, there's a mix of randomized and non-randomized controlled trials, including one cadaveric study. And I think that's just dangerous to try to compare a cadaveric to study to actual clinical papers. And then free, because we know that there's going to be some major differences. And then the freehand technique was studied with and without use of fluoroscopy. And they, they failed to even include studies that looked at freehand technique using um, the OARM navigation system. And furthermore, they failed to take into account the dosage uh, to patients or even measured patients based on their intraoperative C CT scan or radiation dose. So to be honest with you, I don't think many of these conclusions are quite valid. However, the conclusions that could be taken are that this meta-analysis demonstrates that there is high accuracy in pedicle screw placement with robotic technology. There is efficacy and safety that was demonstrated when compared to conventional freehand screws and the potential confounders of the ones we talked about. And furthermore, in included a paucity of data on the different surgical procedures, the level of spinal fusion performed, and the patient pathology for which it was performed. Thank you very much. Uh, George, um, and if, guys, if I may wait, say one thing about this article, and I've read it three times, I don't get the sense from this meta-analysis of how many of these, first of all, of these complications, which they're comparing both groups, are really real-world things. When they're comparing things like wound infections, it, it's difficult to believe all of this is related to a robot. Um, again, I don't get the sense of how many pedicle screws it against realistically are causing a problem. One of the interesting, there was a very famous paper in the neurosurgical world regarding uh, acoustic neuromas and cell phone use and cell phone use effectively doubled the rate. But if the rate of problem goes from one in 400,000 to one in 200,000, it's again, is that really something that's gonna stop our use of cell phones? In other words, I'm not getting the sense from this paper what the real world difference is in things like complication rates from our actual screw insertion. That being said, I, I definitely think it's a valid way of looking at the accuracy in general of screw placement. I agree with you. Well, one of the you points that, that I'd yeah. like to bring up, we've got multiple different <coughs> robotic technologies. Each one of them has an advantage and a disadvantage, and we tend to lump them together. Uh, I, I'd like to see us be more granular and, and not necessarily critical, but evaluate the individual technologies. Uh, some of the robotic arms are navigated arms. Some of them are guided arms. And there's a, a, a big difference in, in the way they work and how you use them. So those are things that we do have to take into account uh, before we lump them into a meta-analysis. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Izzy, and I would tell you that um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of our robotic technology, um, and I'll tell, ask the group if they agree or not, because I had this discussion with Hyun. I worry about accuracy numbers reported and compli clinical complications from screw placement. With It seems like every robotic study, they get a post-op or intra-op CT scan to change the trajectory of the screw. Okay, that is not a reflection of robotic technology. That's a reflection that the CT scanner picked it up. When they compare that to freehand, which doesn't get the intraoperative CT scan um, or the uh, postoperative CT scan necessarily to adjust things, um, I, you got to really be cautious about what true accuracy is and how great this robotic technology is. What do you think about that, Izzy? Again, we're, we're mixing variables. And the points you make are, are legitimate points. We, we have to be much more specific in what exactly are we evaluating when we say pedicle screw accuracy. Yeah, I mean, just in general, I think, you know, obviously robotic assist or navigation assisted, you know, whether you use a CT or interop CT is going to be more accurate in a longer, you know, the more you do it, right? So the more pedicle screws you put, obviously there's gonna be some differential. Um, but the idea is, is that, you know, it, there's also an institutional financial cost, time cost, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's always more expensive to go from 95 to 98% than it is to go from 85 to, 
95%. So it's, you know, how good do we need to be and how do we justify that cost is another issue. I mean, I think, you know, OARM, we've gotten the OARM and I think OARM has increased accuracy by a tremendous amount. Obviously there's a patient cost at that, right? Because the patient gets irradiated, but that I think has justified, you know, it's definitely increased accuracy. The question is, can we justify the robot on top of that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure if it's worth, and I'm not sure the difference between OR navigation and robotic navigation. I mean, I do get the idea of preoperative planning, which may end up with better surgery. Um, but I think that's the, that's the challenge, right? OR is pretty damn good. Okay, let's move to our last uh, paper. There are actually um, a complement of two. Um, and the topic on this is robotic learning curves. They'll be presented by Andrew Trontis, our orthopedic spine fellow. And um, hopefully you can get through this uh, quickly so we can kind of start doing a discussion on learning curves and just everyone's experience at the end. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Dr. Kim. So my uh, two papers are very closely tied together. They're essentially from the same author group at the same institution. Uh, and one is sort of the 2019 and then the 2020 versions of these papers. So we can, we can talk about the first and second separately and then discuss them together. So the first paper is called, uh, Does the Accuracy of Pedicle Screw Placement Differ Between the Attending Surgeon and Resident in a uh, Navigated Robotic Assisted Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery? Uh, it's from the Journal of Robotic Surgery, submitted in 2019, published in 2020, from the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health, uh, San Antonio. It's a retrospective study of the first 101 navigated robotic assisted spine surgery cases at a single site. So uh, they uh, used their attending surgeon and their PGY6 neurosurgeon and just cataloged and then published uh, their experiences in the first 101 cases. It's a level four study. Their purpose uh, was twofold. Number one, is there a difference between the resident and the attending and their accuracy using this uh, robot? And number two, um, they focused on the left versus right sided pedicle screw placement. Uh, their methods are these 101 cases. It's a 26 year uh, attending versus a neurosurgery PGY6, mm -hmm. which was likely an infolded um, neurosurgery fellow, as that is uh, how it was described in the second paper. Uh, their technique was using the Globus Excelsius GPS robot. Nav data was either from intra op spin or from pre op CT. Uh, imaging every CT, every patient got a post op CT for um, checking screws. Their outcome measures. Uh, were the uh, Groot Spine and Robin system uh, used to judge screw accuracy. This is the, um, the one that we just heard uh, George describe uh, with A and B being called uh, accurate screw placement uh, with C, D, and E being considered inaccurate. Uh, their stats were a mean and standard deviation for each group um, and an independent samples t-test. Uh, for their results, uh, they found that both sides, left and right side of the patient were both exceptionally accurate with the left side being 98.5% A and B and the right side being 97.5% A and B, which were found to be not statistically uh, different. Uh, and there was no uh, meaningful discussion of resident versus attending as it applies to these sides. Uh, we can infer that both were exceptionally accurate as both were essentially all uh, Gertzbein A or Gertzbein B. And their uh, conclusion from this study was uh, the arrival of robots allows residents to place screws like attendings. Uh, limitations for this study was they had no consideration for progress over time. Uh, so were these uh, inaccurate screw placements early in the process? Were they late? They, they actually focused their entire second paper on this question. Uh, they don't have any data regarding previous experience with the robot. So we don't know if one of those uh, fellows may have had the chance to use um, the robot previously in their uh, education or if the attending had gotten to a chance to develop it or use it uh, beforehand. And finally, uh, they have no comparison group of screws without a robot to assess accuracy. So uh, does this, is this what uh, freehand play screws look like as well? Are they all Gertz by an A and B? We don't know from this paper. Uh, instead of allowing discussion, I'm gonna go straight to the second one because they're essentially the same paper. Uh, same author, same institution, now published in World Neurosurgery 2020. Uh, this is now a retrospective review of the first 120 cases. So we've now added 19 cases from the previous year. Uh, and what we're focusing on instead is uh, PGY-6 neurosurgery infolded fellows versus an attending. Uh, the groups were broken down by uh, all three of them. So you see the uh, results from the attending and then the two neurosurgeons. The first neurosurgeon performed uh, uh, over two thirds of these. 
uh, the first fellow, sorry, the second fellow then joined for the last approximately 50 cases. And that does uh, show in their accuracy and learning curve uh, results. So here you can see uh, this is their uh, post-operative evaluation doing their guidance versus their uh, final uh, CT scans to see where they are. And I'm gonna skip to the good part for the consideration of time, which is to look at their uh, results. Uh, this is the tip, tail, and angular uh, accuracy of the AS attending surgeon, F1 fellow one and F2 is fellow two. Uh, instead of using the Gertzbein classification, they instead chose to see based off of the pre-op plan how many millimeters away is the tip of the screw compared to where it was supposed to be? How many millimeters was the tail away and how many degrees uh, was it off of where it was supposed to be? The attending surgeon and fellow, like I said, did the first two thirds of these and they show significant improvement at about the 30 screw mark. So if you look, we're at about the two, two and a half range for attending surgeon and fellow one. After 30 cases, they nestle down into the about one and a half millimeter range. Uh, fellow two who came in seven months into the process started where these guys ended uh, at the about one and a half uh, case range, one, uh, sorry, one and a half millimeter range about after, before and after his 30 cases in. So a uh, fellow two who had had the robot at his institution for seven months did not show the same improvement as, as his uh, attending surgeon and first fellow colleagues. That's it. Andrew? Yes, sir. So I, one question I had when reading these papers is, it's, I, I mean, I work with fellows and residents all the time. I'm always correcting the person on the other side of the table. And if, as long as attending is in the room, this is like meaningless data, because I would love to know how good the fellow is with this with me, like sitting in the lounge. Uh, we can find out tomorrow if you'd like. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, my, my experience, we have not had a chance to do a robotic case uh, together, uh, but my experience has been that I generally get a much longer leash when the robot is in the room because uh, the robot is standing in as that second pair of hands for me. So I don't want to say that my attendings are in the lounge, but uh, I get a lot less scrutinized supervision, I think, when the robot is in the room. Yes, just for the record, the attending is in the room. They're not in the lounge or in clinic or anywhere outside of what the patient right. at the theaters. So for the, last, for the last 20 years, I've been saying that a robot is not going to make a bad surgeon good. What it does is it makes a good surgeon more precise and more efficient. You still have to learn how to be a good surgeon. And yeah, I agree with uh, Eli that this paper is absolutely meaningless because you are not letting your resident or fellow do something that's going to be dangerous, whether they're doing it freehand or with a robot. So I, I don't think that uh, we should put any credibility into those numbers. Yeah, this is, this is the end. So I, I completely agree with this, uh, but this would have actually been a great opportunity for a cadaveric larger scale study where uh, our residents and trainees could have the freedom to do this. And just in self-declaration, I've put in a couple of pedicle screws in my life, and a certain company had a very cool virtual reality kind of a training game with which you can try to put in pedicle screws. And I'm a somewhat competitive person, and I compared myself to uh, uh, my fellows. And this younger generation has different skill sets than an old fart like me. I was impressed with how good they could translate this uh, kind of a different digital information into a end product compared to somebody who improved, but I was never kind of able to get to that high stratosphere that I aspire to. So, so newer technologies do offer an opportunity for the next generation to excel. But completely agree. The premise of this article was an interesting one. The execution in real life patients is irrelevant. Eli hit it on the head. I'm not going to let a patient go out of the room with a subpar screw. It's out of question. Uh, not, not even remotely okay. You know what, I'll, I'll, um, I, I think Todd wants to say something, but I'll say something first. Um, I'm telling you that the robotic learning curve is better than navigation. Navigation, O-arm, that was a pain. That was a pain. It took 30, 40 cases, and if you didn't stay with it, it got worse, and then you had to keep doing more. And then once you hit about 100 plus cases, that's when you really were able to fly with it. Robotic learning curve is quick. It's, uh, I don't know what it is about it. We're learning, we're studying it right now, but it's quick. 
um, especially the newer generation. I know Izzy, you published a paper with the uh, older one that said 30 cases, 25 to 30 cases. Also, number two, the technology is transferable. I don't need to um, tell uh, Andrew um, very much after the first couple screws. It's intuitive for him. I don't know if it's because he's a millennial, um, but this technology is just is working um, well with our trainees. One thing I uh, would say about this is um, I think robotics uh, clearly have a, a big application. But the one thing robotics don't give the young surgeons or the young fellows is uh, tactile. You know, surgery is tactile. It's feel. And, you know, placing a screw and, and, and all that. I think it's really important that as residents and fellows learn that they really learn how to, to feel a pedicle with a finder, really get that tactile feel figured out first. Um, because it, that that's part of the skill set of surgery and, and the robot doesn't provide that for, for for the learning surgeon and those of us who've had you know many years of experience that's certainly easier but i think that's just an important thing to keep in mind as we as we progress through modern technology hey todd you sound like an old fart listen they're working on that the technology is unbelievable I saw some uh, technology that you can use to uh, do simulated surgery that you can train the fellows on. They have the haptics and everything. It is just amazing what's going to happen. So, you know, I found the discussion very interesting, but when we look at the younger faces on this panel, in 20 years from now, you won't even have a discussion about robotics. It will be part of our armamentarium, and you won't have people talking about tactile sensation and how good we used to be. I mean, we're all farts. I mean, the new generation is going to have a completely different way of doing surgery. Hey, Rick, speak my for question, yourself. I mean. <laughs> yeah, my, my question would be, do we have a feel, and maybe Izzy does, or, or guys from Cedars, since we were using the robot to train fellows, the last, you know, three to five years, what's the penetration when they when they go out in practice that they continue to use a robot? Do we have a feel for that? I'd say in, in, out of our fellows, it's probably about 25% of them. Uh, it depends on what market they're going to, uh, but I've kept in touch with a number of them that have started using uh, the various robotic technologies. So it's, it's it's a quarter. It's not as much as I would have anticipated, but it's still there. It also, uh, I interviewed two days ago uh, for another job, and the uh, even bringing it up, the first response I get is, "What you can't do it without it?" And I said, "No, no, 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 no. That's it's not anything <laughs> like that." But they didn't have one, and so it was it was taboo to bring up. Yeah. Well, I ha I have to chime in a little bit as well, and when. Terry says that the uh, learning curve is shorter. It's, it's true that the navigation learning curve that I was on, we published, I think, our first papers back in about 1996. So that's, I think, 24 years. And uh, it took a long time to make navigation work. But this is a fast forward. And, and I disagree with Todd a little bit uh, that you don't get tactile feedback. You don't get the freedom, but a robot basically, in its current iteration, is lining things up and then you do the operation yourself and you have tactile feedback, you got the haptics. Um, it's not like doing it freehand and we still do enough of those that I think the fellows are getting training and, and uh, you know, this is a learning curve. That's what this is all about. That's what we're talking about here. And, and uh, Rick is right, is that this is going to be the norm of the future as that, you know, people said, oh, navigation, I don't need it. I can put pedicle screws in and I, you know, there's a few of us that are on the on the panel here today that we all said some of those things, but it's a learning curve. We're going to be using this stuff and it's going to get better. This is like, Izzy, is it first or second generation? I don't know, but that's where we are. Hey guys, it's, it's Neil. Now, I, I agree with everything you guys said. I think the biggest thing, Izzy, for me with the robot is there is no OAM. You have no idea how much time it'll keep staying in. The OAM is not in the room anymore. It's pre-op planning, robot comes in, you do it. And yes, there's tactile feed taught. It's, it amazes me how you can have an air ball with the robot. You gotta have that tactile feel to know that you're not in bone. That may be something we do have to teach people. But other than that, the robot learning curve is short. It's really short because it lines it up for you and the rest of it, you just trust it. 
it's a trust factor that I think took me longer than anything else that really got to trust this thing and it's, it works. So I'll give you that, it definitely is there and, and, and there's no, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep saying it forever. Took the navigation off the room. It was the best thing we ever did. Hey guys, On that note, yeah, go ahead, close it, uh, close it yet. Jack, take us out of here quickly with one word of wisdom here. Uh, robots and have a good weekend. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Cedar, guys. Be safe, Hi, guys. everybody. See you You're around. All right, see you next week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.